This is my presentation about uh, CubeFit on Talos. Uh, I call it my home lab journey for the past, uh, let's say, nine months. So um, this should work. Sorry. Yeah, just now. So run CubeFit, they said. <laughs> it would be fun, they said. It took me literally seven months when working on my spare free time. So not my pro professional time, 36 hours a week, but um, yeah, in the evenings until two o'clock or something. Yeah. So um, who am I? Uh, my name is Michael Tripp. I'm from Apeldoorn, the Netherlands. I'm an, as we call it, open source consultant at AT Computing. I'm a Kubernetes trainer. I uh, give a uh, few types of uh, Kubernetes courses, uh, a bit more um, fundamentals, a bit more advanced courses. I currently work at the Dutch Tax Administration where we do uh, OpenShift stuff. Um, I'm a Linux geek. I started in 2004. I have some Red Hat certifications, uh, including the OpenShift certifications what, uh, what Pip was talking about. Uh, Pepijn. Sorry. Yeah. Um, my past hypervisor experience. I started with uh, VMware GSX back in 2008. And that was a type 2 hypervisor that you install on Windows or either Linux and then you run your virtual machines on that. After that, I went uh, with uh, the ESXi uh, from uh, version 3.5. After that, I did some Hyper-VX and uh, uh, Proxmox and KubeFed. So, um, I have a bit of a hypervisor experience um, from the past. And IOS Arch, by the way. So uh, just wanted to, to say that um, because everyone who uses Arch says that so. <laughs> so the topics of today, um, first I'm going to talk a bit more about my home lab. Then what makes a good hypervisor, and that is my personal opinion, there are a lot of opinions when it comes to hypervisors, but this is my personal opinion. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what KubeFert is, uh, a little bit about architecture. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the KubeFert installation on Talos, the CDI, Container of Data Importer. Some more about freelancer networking, hyperconverged storage, and shared storage. Live migration. I'm going to do two demos, but I pre recorded those because the demo gods. <laughs> So, um, and after that, I'm going to give you my takeaway and conclusions on KubeFit and Talos. So my home lab, um, I started this project in January the last year. Um, I had some spare time and it was winter. So when it's winter in the Netherlands, it rains or it snows. So I'm not going outside very much. So I was just thinking about, let's make a KubeFit cluster. <laughs> So I started out with uh, three nodes. Um, there, uh, there are one uh, HP Pro Desk and two Elite Desks, also from HP. And I combined it, uh, a cluster with three nodes. Um, I started with the control plane and worker um, roles on uh, each of these th uh, three machines. But after some problems with etcd, I uh, decided to, uh, to rebuild the whole thing and run etcd as a virtual machine on my Proxmox machine. Which I, which I already have. So my um, current home lab uh, consists of one Zimmer board running NFS, just one single uh, terabyte uh, SSD, uh, three worker nodes running bare metal Talos 176. Uh, two of them are uh, two HP Elite desks with a uh, Core i5 processor. Nothing fancy like um, it's the 800, G2, it's like uh, eight years old, so it doesn't matter much. Um, one uh, HP Pro Desk, which is even older. And I run one virtual control plane on my uh, Proxmox, uh, already uh, uh, used hypervisor. And the end goal for my project was to have an enterprise-like virtualization cluster. So, um, yeah, I like trying things out. I'm um, The past uh, seven months, I worked at the Dutch Tax Administration where I didn't do many technical stuff. So I was just uh, using for a, uh, a challenge. So I uh, decided to uh, run uh, 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 Talos. So um, this is basically my home lab. So this is the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, this is the Elite Desk, this is the Elite Desk, this is the Pro Desk. So MicroTik switched from 10 years old 
and my Zima board with one SSD. So uh, nothing fancy on this side, but it, it does the job for me just to test things out, make a proof of concept for myself. So um, yeah, just for the looks, it doesn't look much, but it's, it is doing its, its job. So uh, yeah. Um, so when talking about hypervisors, what makes the perfect or ideal hypervisor for me? Um, yeah, so uh, hyperconverged storage. For me, it's, it's a big uh, uh, thing. Um, I've worked with uh, VMware in the past, VSAN, um, when uh, using Ceph on OpenStack, you have hyperconverged storage. Also, uh, shared storage uh, on, on NFS is also uh, very needed for me. VLAN or software defined networking, software defined ne networking support, sorry. Um, basic support for VLANs, bridges, uh, virtual switches like VMware NSX. Um, live migration is also a hot topic. I want to move my virtual machines from one node to another when I decided to plan maintenance. Um, templating either through golden images. For the young guys out there, um, I'm not going to explain the golden image thing, but it's like um, creating an image, uh, uh, generalizing it, and uh, creating a template from that image. But I uh, like to use Cloud Init nowadays. So um, there are some uh, opinions about Cloud Init, uh, <laughs> but I um, I dig it. Yeah. <laughs> um, snapshotting, either live or offline. Um, memory sharing. It's so what we call KSM kernel, same page memory sharing, or memory sharing in uh, vSphere is called page sharing. Uh, so you uh, can have uh, multiple of the same Linux machines. So your memory density gets a bit lower in the kernel, but the, your kernel needs to support that. Um, also overcommitting CPU and memory, also a big thing when running hypervisors or a uh, production or cluster. Sometimes you want to over provision to, uh, to give the customer more memory than you actually have in your hypervisor. So it's also a big thing for me and a very nice UI. Um, we all love YAMLs, but sysadmins need a graphical user interface. So um, yeah, those are my uh, main, main takeaways of what makes a good hypervisor in my uh, opinion. And it should be API driven. So um, API first when, um, when it is possible. So, Basically, what is Kubeford? Well, it's it's it basically runs your virtual machines on Kubernetes. That's the short version. Um, it extends the the Kubernetes API uh, to uh, use the CRDs, so you can use virtual machines, virtual machines snapshots. Everything is a custom resource in Kubernetes. It uses libvirt, QMU, and uh, KVM, and you can run uh, containers alongside virtual machines, so you can have a, a mixed. A cluster for mixed workloads. Um, some fun facts. Um, uh, um, it is used as a main component for Harvester it's from SUSE. And uh, OpenShift also uses it uh, for OpenShift visualization. And as of uh, the 5th of September, Red Hat is doing the most commits on KubeVirt. So um, every product that Red Hat makes and, and uh, puts a lot of effort in, um, yeah, they create basically or uh, contribute to very good products like KubeFred. And there is a lot of uh, love and hate in the open source community about Red Hat, but sometimes they do a pretty good job and uh, invest really good or really money into certain open source projects. So, um, yeah, uh, this is a little bit about architecture. So um, basically, uh, when I install Kubeflare, there are two controllers, the third controller and the third API controller. Then there's one daemon set, it's the third handler. And the third handler basically um, schedules the, uh, the virtual machine. So what it basically does, it, uh, it uh, deploys a uh, pod called third launcher, which uh, um, uses libvirt-d and qmu. And uh, in that pod, we have two containers. It's the compute container, you can see it here, but it's a compute container and the, a third logger container, which basically outputs the, uh, the output for the T2I. Um, so this is all done with the uh, uh, Kubernetes scheduler. And the third handler basically reports, yeah, it's, 
it reports to the kubelet and the kubelet reports to the API server. Um, so the, uh, the, the first handler basically schedules the, um, the virtual machines. So. Um, I can talk about uh, uh, this architecture a lot more, but it gives you a, 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 a um, view on uh, how it looks like. Um, so how did I install uh, um, the kubefoot operator? I just like to uh, to apply a basic YAML, so I get the, the latest release, and I just do a kubectl apply minus app for the operator. You can also install it uh, through the operator lifecycle manager. Um, that's uh, the OLM is a uh, also a product by Red Hat, uh, where you can use operators to uh, to upgrade and uh, deploy stuff. So it's it's a little bit of the uh, OpenShift way to deploy certain uh, operators, but I like to keep it uh, simple and just use the uh, direct YAML for that. Um, after that, we are going to uh, deploy a basic kubefit custom resource, um, which I uh, configured a, a few special things uh, for the feature guides for live migration, network binding plugins, and snapshots. I thought this one was deprecated, but I didn't remove it, so sorry for that. Um, and I configured some SM BIOS here, so you can uh, uh, give your virtual machine an, an own, uh, like a machine name or that kind of stuff. So uh, instead of an HP Elite Desk, it now, uh, I if I start a virtual machine, it, it says uh, Talos Cloud when running uh, FastFetch or NeoFetch. Um, for the fact is that I didn't know about the SM BIOS uh, until I took a look at the code of Cat uh, Morgan for the ContainerCraft project, and I came across this, and I was like, wow going to use that, so yeah. Um, so um, when using the SM BIOS, you can uh, give your virtual machine uh, a, a own, uh, yeah, how do I call it? Um, name for, um, as a system machine name or a uh, motherboard name or that kind of stuff. So, um, and uh, this is as simple as applying the, the, this YAML and uh, 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 the kubefit controller will create the third handler, the third API, for you and uh, everything is set to go. Um, and then I installed third CTL, which is basically a, uh, a application to control uh, kubefert. You can install it with crew or uh, download the binary. I prefer crew for that. Uh, crew is a, is a kubectl plugin manager. So if you don't know uh, that, uh, check it out. There are a lot of uh, nice plugins uh, for uh, crew. So after that, um, yeah, it was cool, but <laughs> I, uh, there, were, there were some caveats where I uh, came across along the way. So um, when using a single disk node, make sure to upgrade Talos with dash dash uh, preserve is true. Uh, in 180, uh, this will be the default behavior, but um, yeah, it wiped my whole system and all my virtual machines were gone. So <laughs> um, make sure to, to set an exemption for the kubefit namespace when using pod security. Otherwise, uh, strange things will happen. Um, and when using Multus, and I'm going to talk about Multus. Uh, <laughs> Multus, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of, a, it is a pain in the ass, um, but you have to configure your bridge when using Multus. So this is just a snippet of my YAML file for the uh, worker node for the, that I apply with the Talos CTL. Uh, it basically drills down that you have a bridge interface, and I call it uh, BR0 but make sure to configure it. Um, when I first configured it out of the box and I applied it uh, um, directly with the bridge interface configured, my node went down and never came up. So I uh, reapplied it with a uh, IP address uh, from the DHP server. And after that, I reapplied the bridge and then it worked uh, magically. So, um, But th those are my personal experiences. Your, uh, your, experience, your experience may, may, uh, may be uh, different, but... Um, so it was ready, and then I um, I went to a next one called the CDI. <laughs> it's the containerized data importer. Um, at first, I had uh, uh, a very hard time understanding what it was. Was it really necessary? Well, it turned out it was because I'm importing, um, as I call uh, call it, base OS disks with cloud in it for the. Um, for kubefit to use, so I can initialize that as a base image and configure it and uh, create a virtual machine. So um, 
what is the CDI? Uh, it's called a containerized data importer. Um, it is used to import disks before the creation of a virtual machine. You can import QCOW2, uh, RAW, or uh, ISOs. So you can import an ISO. What it, uh, uh, sorry, the data sources can come from the upload from the client. So you can use uh, first CTL uh, client upload and then upload that, that, that directly to your um, uh, 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 CDI operator and it creates a uh, PVC for you. You can also uh, uh, do a direct HTTP or HTTPS call, or you can pull the image from the container registry or another uh, persistent volume client. And you can create a CR called data volume where you can specify your, uh, your actual data volume. And in the next slide, I will show you uh, how that looks like. And the data volume basically creates a persistent volume claim for you. So um, first I installed it just like I did with um, Kubefit, just a, the normal route, uh, deploying the operator. And, um, but you can also use the operator lifecycle manager for that. After that, I created uh, the CDI uh, custom resource where I specified some interesting stuff like the scratch space storage class. And um, I uh, um, did some pod resource requirements. And I'm going to talk about it in, in a few slides why I did that. Because um, th things went to shit when I applied it without. So. Um, this is a basic uh, data volume uh, custom resource where I uh, basically import a Debian 12 generic cloud image. Uh, in the namespace virtual machines, and I uh, give it the name uh, Debian 12 image, and I'm going to write it to my Zima board NFS. Um, so when I run this, um, the uh, the CDI will uh, create a pod for you. It will download the uh, the QCOW2 image, and it will create a PVC for you, basically what it does. But um, sorry, there are some caveats when I did it for the first time. Um, and I will talk about it later, but it was very funny for me. Um, <laughs> this is the, CD, uh, the, the CR that I use for actually, actually creating a disk for a virtual machine um, based on the image disk uh, for the Debian 12 image. And I basically write it to my Longhorn read, write, many storage, and I uh, give it 10 gigabytes of uh, space. And I use the access mode read, write, many because I would like to have um, live migration and that kind of stuff. Caveats yeah, again. Um, when, uh, when I started out first, um, it, it, it kept on crashing. Uh, it was very strange behavior. So I was reading a bit more about it and I uh, literally, literally had to configure the scratch space storage class with a local pod provisioner to get it to work. So basically what the CDI does, it, it, it writes two gigabytes of scratch space, and then um, I think it, 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 it exports the image to that uh, space, but it first, first has to write some scratch space to local disk. So it was crashing all the time. And I, uh, I didn't understand why it was. After some reading, I tried it and it worked. So yeah, um, strangely enough, um, it took me like uh, four nights or something to get this to work. Um, but then the next hurdle came along. Um, when the, 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 the importer pod for the CDI imported my disks, it crashed all the time because it was unkilled. So I had to uh, configure some specific resources for that. So I uh, configured the pod requests and limits uh, other than the, the standard configured ones to uh, allow it to work. So that was my uh, CDI adventure. Um, after that, my, uh, my basic KubeFit cluster was ready. And, um, but I had to uh, configure some, uh, some new things like uh, networking, uh, hyperconverged storage, shared storage, and uh, live migration. So um, for VLANs with, uh, uh, VLANs with, with N, sorry, <laughs> uh, with um, networking, I used Multi, so you can um, uh, expose your virtual machines directly to the layer two interface of your uh, worker nodes. Um, I, um, I configured shared, shared and hyperconverged storage and I chose uh, Longhorn for that. Um, yeah, 
Lorne has its quirks, but it works for me. And for live migration, I needed a live migration uh, CR to be created. Um, and um, most importantly, when using live migration, you have to have a storage class where to read write many, because all the worker nodes need to connect to that uh, uh, PVC uh, altogether. So uh, read write many um, is a very uh, big, uh, important thing to configure. So, um, Multus. Um, uh, when I first found out that the Multus existed, I was a bit flabbergasted again. It was another tool or an extension, but yeah, that's how the Kubernetes world works. It works with extensions or tooling. And after reading some documentations about Multus, I first thought I'm not going to go down that road, I'm going to skip it. But after a while, I thought, why not? Well, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Multus. I configured Multus uh, to, to expose it um, to the network, but um, the basic rule of thumb is here, only use Multus when you want to expose your virtual machine to the external network. If you have uh, broadcasting things or multicasting things that need to be directly on the layer two network of your uh, worker node, configure it. If not, skip it. So that's a, uh, that's a, uh, a, a very important thing to remember. But I uh, chose to go down that road and, uh, um, yeah, configure Multus. So firstly, make sure that your bridge is configured properly because uh, Multus needs to be connected to that bridge. After that, you can install Multus. Um, it's basically a CNI meta plugin to attach multiple interfaces to pods. So you can also use Multus to uh, directly attach the external interface of your worker node to a pod. There are some scenarios um, why you want to do that, but um, yeah, as I said, uh, don't go down that route. Also, make sure to patch the daemon set. Um, Talos uh, uh, uses a, a different kind of uh, uh, mount layout or uh, directory layout than uh, Multus expects. Um, and I installed Whereabouts. Whereabouts is another plugin on top of uh, Multus, or uh, as we call it, call it a CNI plugin, which basically assigns IP addresses cluster Y to your virtual machines. So when I have a DHCP server and I, and I have multiple uh, virtual machines uh, with Multus connected to that uh, bridge interface, DHCP doesn't work properly. I don't know why, but I uh, came across Multus and what, mo uh, sorry, Whereabouts and what that basically does is um, make sure that you can, uh, um, uh, it acts like a DHCP server, uh, but it's only needed when using multiple nodes on your cluster. Um, that is because uh, when you don't use um, uh, whereabouts, um, there is no database shared between nodes. So um, when uh, a VM is scheduled on node A and it, and it, and it get moved to node B, the cluster doesn't know where the node is. So Multus can uh, um, solve that problem, or whereabouts, sorry, to, um, to have a, a sort of IP address management database across the nodes. And you have to create a network attachment definition, and after that, you connect that network attachment definition to your uh, virtual machine. So this is basically the patch. So I uh, patched the, uh, the, the host path of the uh, volume Hostpath run NS uh, to slash far slash run slash net NS. Um, if you don't do that, Multus will uh, install, but it will not configure itself properly. And all your uh, uh, newly started pods will be in any state of despair. Or it, they are not starting. So, um, now I came along this in the, uh, or, or I read about this in the documentation of Talos. So, uh, yeah. Um, after that, I created a network attachment definition which basically configures a range for me to use. And this is the same range as where my uh, worker nodes live in. And I give it a start range and an end range. So this, this, this basically guarantees that this range is being used on, uh, as whereabouts for the um, DHP server. After that, I configured the gateway and I had to specifically configure the route because it didn't work when I, <laughs> when I uh, didn't configure it. So I had to configure a a uh, static route with the destination uh, for it to work. Um, and after that, I attach the um, virtual machine or the network name, which is the 
namespace slash the name of the network attachment definition to my virtual machine. And after that, I got an uh, external IP address and uh, everything was working properly. Um, basically, it comes down to this. Uh, don't use multis if you don't have to. Um, only use it when you have a specific use case for it. Um, yeah. So shared storage, I, uh, um, I had some experience with storage in the past, so my setup was quite clear. Local path provisioner for temporary storage for the CDI, so it, so it could run a scratch space. Uh, the NFS CSI for uh, my ISOs and disk images. And Longhorn for hyperconverged storage. Um, Longhorn is a, it's a debate worth on its own, um, but for me it was the only viable solution because I only have a single disk setup. I could use Rookchef, but Rookchef doesn't support single disk installations. So you have to have a separate disk for Rookchef to make it to work. So um, single disk not supported. And for Longhorn, I had to create a storage class with a read-write many because I want to use it for live migration. So this is basically the storage class that I configured for Longhorn. And uh, this basically does the magic. It creates a uh, NFS server in the cluster and uh, some magic happens and uh, you have a, a read-write many class in Longhorn. Um, if you want to use Longhorn for normal storage, read-write once, you have to install the iSCSI extension in Talos. If you don't do that, uh, Longhorn will uh, refuse to install because you have to use, uh, um, Longhorn uses iSCSI um, uh, for your connections when using read-write uh, once. Longhorn creates an NFS server per replica item. So when I have a PVC, it creates three, uh, it creates one, uh, one NFS pod within the cluster for the, for the replicas. And it is based on the Ganesha product, uh, project. It's a NFS server that can, use in, uh, that can run in user space. So uh, with traditional NFS servers, you have to have some kernel things or kernel parameters to, to make it to work. But for um, the Ganesha project, you can run it in user space. So this is ideally when you want to use NFS in Kubernetes. And as lastly, make, um, the CSI provisioner will create the uh, PVC on that NFS server for you. So um, Longhorn basically starts an NFS server for you and the CSI provisioner will create a PVC on that NFS server. And make sure to do a bind mount in slash far slash lib slash Longhorn for your worker nodes. If you don't do that, um, it doesn't work. So, long on, um, very simple for me to deploy. I've deployed it multiple times. We've also uh, deployed it in enterprise environments and uh, long on for me was ready to use. Um, after that, I started uh, my first virtual machine and um, yeah, it, it worked, but I had to enable um, the live migration in the kubevert custom resource and I had to use a read write many storage class and I had to enable migration as I said in the feature gate of the kubevert uh, CR. You can simply uh, migrate virtual machines by using the kubectl vert migrate command and you can migrate the virtual machine from one node to another. It, it is as simple as that and it works perfectly also, it works over one gigabyte connections. So, if you have a long, if you have a home lab, it works. It 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 can be a bit slow, but it works. Um, when we're running that command, it basically creates a new custom resource uh, called virtual machine instance migration, which actually actually um, um, instructs the the third handler to um, to migrate the virtual machine from one node to another. Um, one last note about live migration. I have uh, two different nodes in my worker cluster. So I had to uh, spec uh, specify a, um, a CPU type for that. So um, Qubit sets certain labels for the CPU model migration slash CPU type. And I just uh, checked all the labels, and, uh, the labels and I chose a CPU type that was um, for the label that was available on all my three nodes. So I have a uh, specific CPU configured because else I can't uh, do a uh, migrate because of different CPU architectures or CPU family or generations. 
So make sure that if you have three different nodes to configure a uh, CPU type for that. So this is basically uh, a, um, an example of how I configured that um, CPU. So um, I choose the hash role node TX IBRS. I don't know exactly where it stands for, but that was the label that was most common on all my okay. three worker nodes. Um, but what about um, templating? Because templating is also a very big part or, or, or um, for me as my vision for a um, ideal hypervisor. You can use templating uh, with the virtual machine clone custom resource. Um, I didn't use it yet, but I uh, read some documentations about it and you can uh, simply configure it as the way that you would like to do it with a golden image. So you create a, a golden image, generalize it, shut it down, and use the virtual machine clone custom resource to create a clone of that virtual machine. Uh, snapshotting is also supported when using uh, the virtual machine snapshot custom resource. You have to make sure that your volume snapshot class uh, is uh, configured. Um, it basically draws down that your CSI has to support uh, snapshots. Uh, memory sharing and overcommitment. Um, KSM is not supported on Talos. Uh, I looked at the kernel config um, and the uh, config under, uh, underscore KSM is not enabled in the kernel. So um, is there any Talos developer here? Because I would like to know why you made that choice, but maybe we can talk about it uh, afterwards. Um, and overcommitment is also not supported by Kubefit. So um, overcommitment is still in beta phase. I uh, read a uh, LinkedIn post of a um, principal consultant at Red Hat in the Netherlands, and he talked about it that it will be uh, ready at the end of this year. So um, then you can use overcommitment. So I now I have two demos. Um, I, uh, I first thought I uh, thought I would do that those live, but my home lab is in the Netherlands. I have a VPN. I can connect to it, but. I decided to uh, to uh, create a pre-recorded demo for that. Maybe uh, in the uh, in the lunch break I can show you some more things live. But um, for now I'm um, I'm uh, going to view you a a, a short uh, a YouTube video about that. So uh, let me see if this works and if I can make it full screen. So um, what I now basically do is I, I show my virtual machine definition uh, shortly because I uh, I um, um, I would like to show how I configure this. So um, this is basically a, a Fedora virtual machine. Uh, you can see that I have configured the CPU here, uh, some disks, and I have one interface called PodNet uh, with the, the masquerade type. So this is basically a standard uh, uh, virtual machine custom resource that I use for my uh, configurations. After that, I uh, Specify some cloud configs for the cloud init uh, to make it to work. And I basically install a fast fetch and HTTPD, and I have a service file uh, configured. I will now apply that uh, virtual machine. And um, as you can see at first, um, this will clone the, uh, um, my Fedora uh, 40 image PVC that I created earlier, as I call it, my base disk images. And um, as you can see, the clone is now scheduled and it is now uh, being cloned to the new persistent volume claim. Um, I speed this process a little bit up because uh, it is very slow over a one gig network, but um, it basically draws down that it now um, clones the, uh, the, the uh, source-based disk image to the target-based disk image. And after that, I'm going to start the virtual machine in a few seconds, I think, yeah. And now uh, uh, the virtual machine is started, and uh, I will now give a command that you can see that uh, the virtual machine instance uh, which the virtual machine creates is being started. As you can see here, it's running on my, cl uh, my cluster called third one, and it is now uh, running on true. And live migration is also true here. And after that, I'm going to open the console of the virtual machine. This is basically done by using um, uh, the TTY output to a, uh, um, a serial console. 
Dat is hou, hou, ehm, lip fruit uses it. Uh, as their core uh, display. So, um, some things are installed um, through the uh, magic of cloud in it. And after that, um, no, takes a few seconds. So I will now uh, exit the, the console in a few seconds, and then um, I am connecting to the virtual machine through SSH in a few seconds. I made a typo here, so I'll ignore my typo. I will connect to that uh, to that IP address. So I have uh, created a service object with a type load balancer uh, because I use metal LBU for that. So I can uh, then basically connect to uh, to that uh, machine. And I can run fast fetch. And I basically, uh, as you can see here, this is the whole, uh, the SM BIOS thing I was talking about. That is uh, right here. And after that, I'm going to curl my uh, HTTP server or my HTTPD server. So you can see that. This also works. So this is basically um, the end of demo one. So what I did is just basically creating a virtual machine with cloud in it to uh, to create a new virtual machine. Um, after that, I have a second demo about live migration. So let me open this one. I have four terminals here uh, on the. Oh on the left, I have a uh, um, I have, uh, the, the virtual machine instance. So this is the running virtual machine. Um, here, I will do a kubectl uh, get virtual machine instance migration so that you can see that the, uh, the CR is created. This is a netcat to, um, to a uh, fort that I have opened. And I will now initiate a, a migration from my Fedora virtual machine. As you can see here, um, the virtual machine interest migration is being created, and you and as you will see here, it will be moved from third two, I think, to third one in a few seconds. And the netcat with a zero point two seconds is still open here, so you can see a connection drop. Okay, this is a post frame, so don't don't let it scare you. It was literally literally uh, one point two seconds uh, for it to migrate to the other virtual machine. So just like we would have with uh, um, uh, VMware live migration, it basically works the, the same way on the same speed. When you're using um, a virtual machine with uh, Multus, it takes about 30 seconds for the network interface to come back up. And that has to do something with the uh, ARP table and it has to be re-announced. So, um, yeah. So, um, demo two. And then my takeaways for uh, for what I've learned in the past uh, seven months in my uh, spare free time. Uh, Talos is really awesome. Um, I loved the way it works and it, and it gave me a new approach on how to deploy an operating system. Um, API driven, API first, I I love the whole philosophy of it. So um, yeah, big kudos to you guys. Thanks. Um, KubeFit is also awesome. Um, it really surprised me first when coming from VMware and Proxmox. Um, yeah. It was a, uh, a learning curve, but it was worth it. I can see it running in production. But there's no enterprise uh, great um, graphical user interface yet. There is a uh, project called the Qubit Manager, which is the most promising, but it lacks uh, authentication and a role-based access control. And you could use OpenShift Console uh, for basic virtual machine management if you would like to configure that. And if you would like to go deeper in down uh, to that hell, uh, please let me know. I can provide you with resources on how, on how to do that because you can run OpenShift Console on vanilla Kubernetes. Um, steep learning curve for me, um, but uh, the Kubernetes world is all about steep learning curve, so why not? <laughs> and, there are, and there are a lot of moving parts, CDI, storage, networking, all those things don't come prepackaged and that can be overwhelming. Um, and the caveats, patch the daemon set for Multus, local path storage uh, to write scratch page for, this, for the CDI, and uh, uh, configuration for the Talos bridge. So um, 
configure your bridge properly. That was my main caveat. And dash dash preserve is true, but that is no longer a, a real thing uh, when 1.8 uh, comes out. But um, yeah, um, I did it uh, a few times uh, without that plaque and uh, all of those things were gone until I Googled a bit and, it, and I was like, okay, um, I have to preserve true and then it works. So yeah, um, my conclusion to round it up, um, Enterprise grade production ready? No, not for me because KSM is not supported at the moment and um, overcommitment for Kubefit is still in beta phase. Um, and there is no enterprise grade uh, graphical user interface uh, as of yet. Um, but a startup grade production ready, of course. But you have to have a staff that is qualified enough to use Kubernetes, Talos, or Kubefit. Um, and you, you won't be relying on a graphical user interface or overcommitment. And when designing a Kubefit cluster or Kubernetes clusters in general, uh, calculate a steep learning curve and uh, design your clusters with care and um, think things out. And don't, uh, don't just deploy it and think it works, but uh, yeah, design it properly. So this was my uh, presentation. Uh, the sources are on GitHub. Um, I still have it in uh, private mode, but I will make it public in, in a few seconds. So uh, don't worry about that. Uh, I have all those manifests that, uh, that I used on that GitHub repository. So you can um, uh, get started for yourself. And um, yeah, start with Kubernetes. It's really a fun thing to do. So this was my presentation just within time. Cool. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, can you bring the microphone to me? I'm a bit deaf uh, on my right here. So. Thank you for your presentation. Yes. I have a question. Are you happy with using uh, Multus? Did you consider no. other solutions um, uh, which are more native, for example, KubeOVN or OVN Kubernetes? I haven't looked at those yet because I, um, I am more a fan of uh, using a service object with uh, Metal LB or a uh, or when using Cilium a BGP uh, announcement or something. Um, I would only like to use Multus when I have a uh, when I have layer two stuff to do, and if not, I don't use it anymore. No, I haven't looked at those other two solutions, so I'm going to write those down. Now. Thank you. Try try Kubeweird. Uh, sorry, KubeOVN. It works uh, out of the box, and we in our platform don't use Multus at all. Okay, thank you. Um, cool. Okay, nice. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, again, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you cordon a node with the VM with VMs on it running Cuba and they support live migration, will they then be live migrated without you having to preemptively run a command to live migrate? Uh, I haven't tried it yet. Sorry. Maybe we could try it in the in the lunch break if you would like. I'm yeah, just let's just trash my whole home lab. I mean, fuck it. <laughs> so yeah, no problem. <clears throat> Sorry. Any other questions or comments or uh, or find me in the lunch break. We can do some cool stuff in an hour. So <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you for coming over here and. Um, uh, thank the, the 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 developer team of Sidero Lab for making Talos. I just love it. It it gave me a whole new opportunity or a whole new look at at, at everything. So thank you. <laughs>